Hello, thank you for tuning in uh, to this series where we're going to be breaking down the changes to the IATF 6949 standard. My name is Mike, this is Russ, we are from Eagle Force, and we want to welcome you to this, this series. We, uh, one of the biggest things about this show, right up front, that we want to mention is your participation. Um, we, we've done another series along this nature for the aerospace standard uh, is 9100 Rev D. And one of the things that has really made that so rewarding is um, user and viewer participation. So we love hearing from you. We love getting your input on what you wanna see us cover uh, in the series. Uh, any questions that you have about stuff that we talk about, any experience that, that you can you know offer as, as insight, any of that kind of stuff. We love hearing from you guys, so we welcome it right up front and we'll say that in every episode yeah um, and, and later you're going to cover how to mm -hmm. how they can contact you and we've as mike indicated we've done a series and are still doing a series on on the aerospace changes what and that's that's been a lot of fun and what's made it fun is your interaction mm -hmm. and um and all your compliments on how wonderful a job that um. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so no. So we're, we want to launch this thing, and, and the whole purpose of it is, you know, we, we want to pre present something to you that will be helpful to you because this some serious changes coming down, and and uh, I know you want to be successful. Yes. We want you to be successful also. Yes. So. We thought there were a lot of changes that happened to the aerospace RevD standard, but yeah. compared to the changes that we're seeing uh, from TS over to IATF, um, it's easy to see why people are feeling overwhelmed and, and that's the reason why we're you know sort of labeling this a series of what you need to know. We right. want to shed light on that for you. And many organizations are going to be really surprised when they see the size of the changes that, that, are, that are in this standard. That's right. So again, we want to help all of you wrap your heads around uh, what's changed and we also want to help show you how to implement uh, some of these changes within your organization. Right. So I thought I'd start by reading the entire standard in a, in a monotone. Side benefit, the series also cures insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could use a higher voice for the ISO portions and you a lower voice for the, for the IETF portion. You didn't take your medications this morning, did you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what we're really going to do is we're going to cover the material in, in topical sessions and... We're going to focus on the major impacts and the major changes and not necessarily the sequence that covering the standard all the way through. I mean, you can read that yourself. So, yeah. Well, we, we wanted to address some of the, the hot button or the key issues, um, both for the standard and the implementation certification process before we actually take a deep dive into any particular topic. So we thought we'd given over what might be helpful is a start by giving an overview of how we got where we are mm -hmm. and um, in, in the history and what's currently happening yes and, and then we'll take a look at the details of the standard itself yeah which i understand you know the desire it's the same one we kind of had when we were sort of crafting how do we approach this giant animal we, there's i'm sure a lot of things that you immediately are, are thinking i just want to know about this or know about that it's worth the time to to take this bird's eye view for a minute, because mm -hmm. if you can understand a little better um, how we got here, you'll understand the context of some of the decisions that were made in the new standard, and it will help you get the right mindset on how to tackle some of the stuff. Right. Um, and again, we, we invite your participation. So yes. it makes it much more interesting and more fun um, for everyone if we get your feedback and you tell us, here, here here's one thing I'm struggling with, and how do we do this, and, and it, so we, again, we don't want this to be us talking to you. We want this yes. to be a conversation. So. Yes. Speaking of talking, uh, why don't you tell us um, where we're, we're, we're starting today and okay. hopefully not in your monotone voice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the film crew is giving me the evil eye, so I probably skipped the monotone <laughs> voice. But So I thought it'd be useful, again, to talk about the history of where we are and how we got where we are. Yes, and this goes back quite a ways. The auto industry, it really is what drove ISO 9001 in the first place. Yeah, ISO 9001 really was craft, first was published in 1987. And uh, it took off in Europe, but it kind of languished in America. Um, really, there was no mandate for in America for initiating and implementing ISO 9000, so it, it, it didn't go anywhere. Yeah, and customers weren't really 
demanding it, so there was no competitive yeah. advantage to doing it either. Exactly, and one of the things we've always seen is without a mandate, business is going to go on the way it always has gone on, and, and they're, they're not going to make these, these changes. Yes. Right. Something as fundamental as this. Anyway, yeah. So. So, so what happened at that point? Well, at the time, the automotive, automotive industry in America was dominated by the big three. Mm. General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Exactly. Yes, and they had their own requirements for their suppliers. So each of them was managing their own supply base um, quite separately, even though a supplier may supply all of them. So a supplier had to maintain three different management systems mm -hmm. and meet that. So what happened was they, they, the, the big three got together and they put together one one management system, they consolidated it all into one management system. Because to muddy those waters even further, if a manufacturer was supplying to more than just the big three, they were trying to comply with multiple management right. systems and being audited by multiple customers. So yeah. like I said, the big three get together, decide to create one thing. Um, in August of 1994, the Quality System Requirements QS9000 was published. And exactly. that was with the help of the Automotive Industry Action Group, AIAG, and others. And they were able to uh, harmonize the big three existing supplier requirements. And so for those of you that are long in the tooth like I am, you may remember it's Chrysler's Quality Assurance Manual was one of them, Ford's Q101, uh, quality System Standard and GM's North America Operations Target for Excellence were, were the three that, that were harmonized. So then with those three harmonized, the only thing that they would have to focus on are just the exceptions. Yeah, and since there were, there were only three, um, when they, they put all their common things together in the QS9000, those exceptions, since there was only three of them, they put those in an addendum to QS9000. So they were all in one document. Yeah. So it, it makes sense that this would drive QS9000 in America since the auto industry is uh, absolute largest in America. Right. Uh, but how did that in turn drive ISO 9001? Well, the, the big three, they, they didn't mandate that everyone become QS9000, but what they did mandate was that all tier ones had to be QS9000 and all tiers and tier two. I'm shedding tears myself, but all tiers twos and three had to be ISO 9001 at least. So that's what that's what drove it. And since there are a lot more tier two and tier three, that drives ISO 9001 for sure. So suddenly, ISO 9001, which no they knew about, but no one was really took it seriously, suddenly became a big deal, and that's what that's what launched all of this. And so, as Paul Harvey used to say. Now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> but, except that actually is not completely the rest of the story. No, I was afraid you'd bring that up again. But <laughs> So what happened was QS9000 was in place. And um, at the time, I was working at a registrar. And we were QS9000 along with every other registrar. And we were all invited to come up to Detroit. And the big three, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, were waiting for us there and we walked in a room and they put on a screen these are our top 50 problem suppliers and guess what they're all certified to QS 9000 <laughs> so each of us was looking through these list hoping that one of our <laughs> clients were on there yeah but the bottom line was that they did not see QS 9000 was making any effect on the quality and on-time delivery of the supply base mm. and they were not happy and so the registrars did not respond in an adequate fashion to that warning so what ended up happening was they pulled the plug on QS 9000 and basically fired all the registrars and they formed the TS 16949 it was originally ISO slash TS for technical standard TS 16949 um, so that's how that came in. So now we've gone from ISO TS 16949 to IATF 16949. Right. And this is another major revision. And so with TS 16949 and now with IATF 16949, this is, this is an industry controlled other party. They are directly controlling the, the, the way the registrars are being managed and the auditors are auditing this thing. They, 
they're very, as you know, if you're TS, you know, this is a whole different ball game. And now with IETF, this is a big step from what we saw before. Yes. And even though the IETF standard doesn't specifically spell out the ISO requirements, they are very much invoked. Yes. Um, it's in, in, you may remember in TS, ISO was embedded right in the, right in the standard. So if you got a copy of standard, you, you had it all. Mm -hmm. But now with the IETF, you get the whole standard, which looks as big as the, the other one did. And anyway, only has the IETF and they refer to ISO, but ISO is still an auditable por portion and still part of the IETF. Uh, yeah, it is part and parcel inside that standard. And we're going to, we are going to dive into all each one of those in, in the coming weeks and as we move through this series. But mm -hmm. for today, we're, we're, about that wraps it up for today because we're kind of running out of time. But what about my monotone? Don't even think about it. But but do, uh, tell us um, what we're going to be talking about next time we get together. Well, it's beneficial to look at the timeline of the IATF 16949. What it'll what it will entail, and what the registrars, how they're coping with this tidal wave that's coming um, and actually upon them right now with trying to get the system going. So tidal wave, you're not going to pull your weather channel limitation again while you're standing in front of a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I was watch, thinking about well, it. Well, don't. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> but we do look forward to hearing from you. Um, like we said towards the top of the show, uh, what makes this show tick is, is hearing from you guys, getting your feedback and your input, what you want to see us cover on the show, questions you have, situations you're, you're staring down the barrel of right now. Um, we'll talk about it right here on the show and help you out as best as we can. Um, if you want to do that, there's a few ways you can get a hold of us. You can contact us through our website. Um, you can email us, or you can leave a comment in the comment section down below. Any of those ways, we'll, we'll, it'll get back to us, and, and we'll, we'll get back to you for sure. And Until then, again, I'm Mike, and this is Russ. We're from Eagle Force. Thanks for tuning in, and until next week, have a See good you. week. <laughs>